This special aeronautics and space report brought to you by NASA. Three thousand uh, miles range to go. CRT displays look good. This research pilot is simulating a landing of the reusable space shuttle. The shuttle is a cargo carrying combination, spacecraft and aircraft, able to carry large payloads to and from Earth and space 100 times or more. It's scheduled for use in the early 1980s. One of the men who'd like to fly the shuttle is astronaut Joe Engel. Here at the Space Division of Rockwell International in California, he describes a full-scale mock-up of the big craft. What we think of as the airplane part of the shuttle, which is what you see right behind me, is 122 feet long. That's about the same size as a DC-9. It has a wingspan of 88 feet, and probably it's a little bigger around than a normal cargo-carrying airplane. A typical mission starts with a vertical launch. After use, two solid rocket booster engines are jettisoned and recovered by parachute. Once in Earth orbit, the shuttle will conduct experiments or rendezvous with satellites, whatever the mission is. During 1975, the United States and the Soviet Union cooperate continuing to work on compatible docking and rescue systems for manned spaceflight. In July, the Soviets launch a spacecraft from the Soviet Union. And NASA launches a Apollo craft in Florida. Seven, six, five, four, three, three two, two, engine one, sequence start. Zero. One, zero, launch commit. We have a liftoff. All engines building up thrust. Moving out. Clear the tower. Uh, Roger, power clear. Roger, Tom, you got good thrust on all engines. You ran on the money. 30 seconds, we're on the way. Uh huh. Here he comes, uh, just above the docking module. Looks real pretty. The two ships rendezvous and dock in space, spending two days together, exchanging crews and experimenting. I am approaching Soyuz. Oh, please, don't forget about your engine. <laughs> Less than five meters distance. Three meters. Three meters. The Apollo Soyuz mission is fully successful. These scientists and engineers are giving commands to the Pioneer 11 spacecraft 500 million miles away. It is now hurtling toward the planet Saturn on the second leg of its mission. Pioneer project manager Charles Hall of NASA's Ames Research Center. Here is Jupiter and the five innermost moons of Jupiter. And on this uh, board here is shown a projection of the trajectory that Pioneer 11 followed as it approached Jupiter. So Pioneer 11 came along here underneath Jupiter around and back and went out in this direction. And why were scientists interested in studying Jupiter? Well, for one thing, we know that Jupiter has a very strong magnetic field, much like the Earth, and to date, it's the only other planet that has a magnetic field. As a result, it also has radiation belts like the Earth. Again, we know of no other planet today that has that. Next stop, Saturn. After traveling another billion and a half miles, Pioneer will arrive in the vicinity of the giant ringed planet in late August 1979. As the 570-pound spacecraft dives between Saturn's rings, it will come within 4,000 miles of its surface. 
the rings orbit Saturn out to a distance of 170,000 miles and could be made up of rocks ranging in size from pebbles to huge boulders. Viking, a mission to soft land two 1,200 pound spacecraft like this on the surface of Mars and search for life there. Launched separately on August 11th and 21st, the Vikings spend nearly a year traveling to Mars, with the first arriving in mid-June 1976, in preparation for a July 4th landing. Once at Mars, the spacecraft are placed into orbit around the planet. The orbiters on board cameras begin methodically photographing potential landing sites to make sure they are safe. The lander is then commanded to separate from the orbiter and starts its six-hour descent through the Martian atmosphere. A parachute pops out about 20,000 feet above the surface. Finally, three terminal descent engines fire at 4,000 feet from touchdown, serving as brakes for the plunging spacecraft. The lander now slowly descends and softly lands. Its camera views the surrounding landscape. The place we want to land is in the northern hemisphere. Now I'm going to tell you about the reasons for this. The first site is here. It's called Chrysi. It's a low, broad, flat valley flowing from the floor of a giant chasm the Caprati's chasm that flows deep and low. It combines the combination of, of biological interest, geological interest, the youthful stuff that must have flown from this chasm system into this very low area. The second site is, is more northerly. Now that site was selected primarily because of our interest in, in water. Cydonia represents one area at, uh, at a high latitude where there is the possibility that sometime during the year, for some small period, that there could be transient liquid water. And for the biological reasons, that liquid water is absolutely paramount. One of the most interesting science experiments is the sampling device. A small shovel on the end of a telescoping arm will reach out, scoop up some Martian soil, then drop it into a chemical analyzer on the Viking landing craft. If there are Mars quakes, they will be transmitted through Viking's legs to an onboard seismometer. Throughout the mission, the orbiters continue photographing and thermally mapping the surface. They serve also as relay stations for data from the landers. These model airplanes have something in common with these real planes. They are all part of a NASA research program to learn more about vortices, tornado-like patterns of air that trail behind the wings of airplanes, causing varying degrees of turbulence. Dave Scott, acting director of NASA's Flight Research Center in California, explains. The vortices are dangerous because uh, these bundles of energy, as they follow behind the aircraft, uh, leaving a wake, uh, have the capability of turning over smaller aircraft uh, as they approach a landing. And uh, because of this, uh, we have a great deal of concern that uh, many accidents can be caused uh, by the vortices or these bundles of energies as they uh, attempt to turn over an aircraft. While all aircraft cause vortices, large heavy jets such as the 747 and DC-10 create the more serious problems. Air traffic density around major airports adds to the severity of the problem. Because of the many aircraft coming in for a landing and the need to sequence one plane behind the other, aircraft are routinely separated at safe distances to avoid the trailing vortex problem. However, this often results in increased fuel use and traffic delays. Smoke generators mounted on the wings of these planes by NASA researchers make it possible to see and investigate the whirling air patterns. The research has shown that by adjusting wing flaps at different angles and by making various design changes, the intensity of the vortices can be substantially reduced. Kansas City, this is the 
sort of thing. I want to get, get the pretty good pictures on you. We've come a long way in weather forecasting since the early balloon launching days, thanks mainly to weather satellites. Just 15 years ago this month, NASA launched the first Tyros weather satellite from Cape Canaveral. The views of Earth were pretty rudimentary compared to today's high-quality pictures, but they proved that routine global weather observation by satellite was possible. With each succeeding one, these weather sentinels have become more and more sophisticated. Here, the synchronous meteorological satellite. Two are already in orbit, with a third scheduled for launch this fall. Besides transmitting cloud cover pictures every 30 minutes, day and night, SMS can receive and send environmental information from thousands of manned and unmanned data collection platforms located at sea, in rivers, lakes, and on land. The synchronous meteorological satellite pictures are made into film loops daily at the World Weather Center near Washington, D.C., to show cloud movement over oceans and land masses. Meteorologists are hopeful that this kind of information will give them clues to the weather conditions that, for instance, cause tornadoes and other fast-moving weather systems. This special report brought to you by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.